you know, kind of like him, get attached to the little feller, don't you? And I'm sure, <laughs> sure miss him when he's gone. So you pray for him, Pastor Danny Bailey. Got to love them, don't you? <laughs> Told Brother Daryl, I think, this morning. I was disappointed he wasn't here last Sunday because I was, and I was expecting for him to give me a visitor's card and everything else, but he wasn't here, so I didn't get that. But uh, in the last three weeks, I've preached in four different states, so that's, that's a little more than I usually do. But uh, good to be here and good to see all of you. We're going to... Um, Finish out our series today. This will be the last message in our series that we've been working on. And if you haven't been counting, there's eight of them. Eight. Of course, we skipped a couple in the middle, you know, because it wasn't here. But there was eight of them. And we appreciate Brother Anthony again for filling in and taking uh, responsibility to, to preach. And uh, proud of him. Just keep praying for him. Keep encouraging him. And uh, uh, we're going to read today in a little while. Not right now, but in a little while. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you... Uh, or one that likes to follow along in the Bible, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and just hang on. We'll get there in a little while, okay? And uh, we'll uh, make sure that we uh, don't forget to read uh, what our thought's about. But we're going to talk about it a little bit, okay, before we uh, get into it. Um, you know, we've been talking uh, these, these uh, eight Sundays, and well, seven so far, and we'll talk about today. Uh, about the Christian life and about getting in the Christian life and staying there no matter what. Just in it for the long haul. We're not going to back out. You know, but it takes that determination. And um, I know a lot of people don't think you can lose it, but you certainly can walk away from it if you want to. You really can. I've encouraged people over the years, you know, if they've never tried Christ, uh, come and try him. Try him. Uh, you know, uh, one writer said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Try him. And if you don't like him, you can always go back to the life you were living. I mean, it's, I, but I've never met anybody that didn't like him, okay? Uh, so if you are a Christian today, we're trusting that you're in it for the long haul. I hope that you are, okay? And if not, you should be. Um, what we're going to talk about today uh, is, is a, um, a little three-word phrase that... Um, uh, has been on my mind. Uh, you know, I like to kind of title scripture or messages, and and uh, the guys in the sound booth want me to title them so they can put a title when they put it on the internet and all that. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is endeavor to persevere. Endeavor to persevere. Uh, let me let me ask you this before we get into that. Uh, how how badly do you want eternal life? It ought to be really important to us, shouldn't it? I mean, that's, uh, I like life. Do you like life? <laughs> I enjoy life. I, I know bad things happen, but overall, I like life. And, and it might be primarily because I don't know anything about death, but I like life. <laughs> and uh, my understanding is that eternal life is far greater than uh, this life. That intrigues me. It intrigues me greatly. You know, I've, I've, I've heard people say over the years they don't believe in a scared religion. You ever heard that? Um, I can say that was definitely a factor in me coming to Christ because I was scared of dying lost and going to hell, and I did not want to go to hell. So you can call that scared religion if you want to. I wanted to be away from it. And the opposite of that, of course, is eternal life. How badly do you want eternal life? Think about that now, okay? And you might say, oh, I really, really want it. Okay, so let's go to the next question. To what end will you go to attain eternal life? How far will you go to reach that goal? If you really want it, if you really want something, do we not endeavor to reach that goal? We do, don't we? No greater goal than eternal life. To what end will you go to attain eternal life? Well, that's where we want to encourage you to endeavor to persevere. Don't ask me where I got that phrase. I'll have to explain it to you, but I'm not going to right now. It's a quote from somebody else. Endeavor to persevere. 
Two big words. Let's define them. Let's look at the definition of endeavor to persevere. To endeavor means a conscientious or concerted effort toward an end. Uh, some big words again, okay? But it's a conscientious. That means you. it's a choice, right? Conscientious means I, I've made a, a choice. I've reasoned this out. I've made a choice. Or a concerted effort toward an end. You have put forth some effort. Concerted means you put forth a little extra effort. That's, that's endeavor, okay? Persevere. To persist in or remain constant to a purpose, idea, or task in the face of obstacles or discouragement. That's a long definition, isn't it? Let's read it again. To persist in or remain constant to a purpose, idea, or task in the face of obstacles or discouragement. To per persevere, I could put it a little simpler by, by saying means to overcome, to persevere, to try as hard as we can. We, we have something out in front of us. We have consciously decided that we're going to reach this goal of eternal life no matter what it takes, no matter if there's obstacles in the way, and believe me, there will be obstacles in the way. And if you've been a Christian very long, you know that. There are things that will come in the way. By the way, that comes from our adversary. We call him Satan or the devil, and that's his job. It's his job. He's there to put things in the way to cause you to stumble, to trip, to fall. You've got to overcome those obstacles, right? We've got to. And it also says that there could be discouragement. Anybody here ever went through discouragement? You've got to overcome that. To what end will we go to attain this eternal life? You've got to be a little tough, okay, to be a Christian. You've got to be a little stubborn to be a Christian. Did you know that? Your stubbornness will keep you from giving in to temptation. You, you gotta, you've got to see that there is a goal out there that you've got to reach. That's what, we're, that's what we're going for. So we're talking about endeavoring to persevere today. I, I, have we got you thinking yet? Thinking, boy, that, that sounds like a hard task. Well, it may be. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Okay? Let's read our text here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Very, very familiar part of it is you... You uh, have had Sunday schools on this over and over, and, and um, you, you know, I'm sure you've heard it preached on, but let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Start at verse 16. We'll read down through the rest of the chapter through verse 27. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly... I receive a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews... I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. Not, or being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. 
I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now let's just pause there before we finish reading that. How, how, how far is Paul willing to go to attain eternal life? Sound like he's willing to do a lot, doesn't it? I mean, some of these things we read right here, before he was converted, and I, I'm really convinced even after his conversion for a long time, there's no way he would have done any of that stuff. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have dirtied his hands with it, okay? But he's saying, I, I, I've been willing to do that. Why? So that I can say, get some people saved. And that's what he's supposed to do, okay? If you didn't notice that, uh, he, he, he's called to preach the gospel. And that's what his job is. But let's go on, okay? And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now notice from verse 24 to 27, he's talking about a runner in a race. I want to remind you that Paul is not talking about a sprinter. A sprinter, that race is starts and finishes quickly. Okay? I mean, the 100-yard dash is just a few seconds long now. Okay? I mean, they... They don't used to, I remember, you know, when I was in school and, and, and we ran what they called the 440, you know, that's one lap around the track. You kind of jogged around. They sprint that nowadays, okay? Life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's a marathon. And a marathon, you know, and, and I, I, it's a long way is all I'm going to tell you. If I told you how long, some of you think, well, I don't know. Because we hear of many marathons, okay? No, this is a marathon. You're in it for the long haul, okay? And I, I know people that run many marathons and marathons, and, and they do hope. They start out hoping to be the first one across the finish line, okay? But if you talk to any of them, if, if, they, if they finish it all, they feel like they've accomplished their goal. I would too. I mean, you're going to ask me to run over 20 miles, I'm going to feel like I've accomplished my goal if I make it to the finish line. And that's what Paul's talking about. Yeah, one's going to win that, that laurel crown. And I, I know, you know, we don't picture laurel crowns. We give medals nowadays and ribbons and little trophies and all that. But a laurel crown that the, the uh, Roman runners would have got was, was actually made out of leaves. It was a temporary crown. And Paul says, we're not, we're not running for a temporary crown. We're running for one that's an eternal crown. And if we're going to do that, if we picture this as, as a marathon race that we're in, think about it with me for a minute. Let's just, let's just be logical about the whole thing. If we're thinking about running a long distance, how much weight are you willing to carry while you're running that long distance? You'll say, you're out of your mind. I'm not carrying anything. Exactly. Endeavor to persevere. What are we willing to do? To what length will we go to attain eternal life? Are we willing to let go of things in this world in order to have eternal life? The writer of the book of Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin with dust so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We must talk about the weights. The weights. What's that writer talking about? Well, he's talking about anything that would hinder you, isn't he? He's not necessarily talking about things that are wrong because he says the weights 
and the sin, right? We, we wouldn't probably have any problem laying down the sins. You had to do that when you were born again. Okay? It's just common knowledge that as Christians, we don't pile sins into our life because we know that sin separates us from God. And if we want eternal life, that would be the easy part to turn loose of, wouldn't it? To lay the sin aside would be the easy part. But, but what about, and I'm not here to, to list it, okay? I mean, I, I, I grew up in a period of time, and a lot of you did, when, you know, we heard a lot of preaching against the radio. That's such a terrible thing, you know. Some of you remember hearing them preach against the radio? Okay, I got a young crowd here today. What about the TV? Oh, you heard, oh, what a terrible thing it was. I still say to this day, if the church had got a hold of it and quit preaching against it, it would be a different thing than it is today because we could have kept control of it and we didn't do it. I think Paul would have used it. Okay, I think he would have. But, think about it now, and I, I mean, I heard him talk about things like that as I was growing up, and, and, and my opinion always was, you know, if you don't like it, turn it off. It's just that simple, right? I mean, you know, it's like Zig Ziglar's uh, uh, definition of a, a hypocrite is the guy that complains about all the sex and violence on his VCR. That is a hypocrite, okay? Why? Because you're in control of it. I, I look at today, and, and I'm not here to, to, to preach against social media. I'm not, okay? Because it can be used for good. I mean, right now it's causing a panic in the world, in America, okay? And I, I told two or three people this morning, I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm going to. I'm still trying to figure out the toilet paper thing. I don't understand that one. I'm sorry, I don't, you know. The hand sanitizer thing, okay, maybe I can figure that one out a little bit, but the very one thing that the Centers for Disease Control, which is our federal branch that's telling us how to do things, and all the doctors are making a recommendation that you do one thing, and I guarantee you go to Walmart today, there will be plenty of soap on the counter. <laughs> and that's, that's the one thing they said you need to do is to wash your hands regularly with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Nobody's buying soap. That concerns me more than the toilet paper. <laughs> I know I'm a guy, but I wash my hands pretty regular, and I use soap. Okay? Social media has created a frenzy. That was a little sideline right there we just went to, right? Okay, we probably shouldn't have went there, but we did. Now you'll rush out and buy all the soap you can. Your car will be full of it. I'm sure you will, okay? Get some of Grandma's lie soap. That'll kill you or, kill, or clean you one. I don't know. <laughs> Social media can be used for what's right. But, but, but listen to me. To me, it's not something I would label as wrong. But it certainly can be a weight. Can it not? That can occupy your mind a lot. I don't know if you're on Facebook or if you're on Twitter or if you're on Instagram, but if that is consuming your life, that is a weight. What you've got to do if you want eternal life is not let that control your life. There are people that have withdrawal. Really. And this could go beyond my imagination, but there are people that have withdrawal from things like that if their internet connection goes down. If they can't get a cell phone signal, they panic. I don't know what everybody else is doing and what everybody else is talking about. I've got to get back on there. Listen, if it's consuming your life that much, that's a way you need to put down. That's the way you need to lay down and you need to lay it down in a hurry. Anything that controls your life, it may not be considered sin, but if it controls your life, that's a weight. Why? Because it's keeping you from even reading the most important book you can read, the Word of God. It's occupying your mind so much that obviously you're not spending the time in prayer that you ought to spend. 
It is controlling you so much that you want to know what everybody else thinks that you're really failing in fulfilling the obligation you have to be a witness to people in the world. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? It's a weight. I will not label it as sin, okay? But I will tell you this, it will drag you down. How far will you go? What are you willing to do? To what length will you go to attain eternal life? Are you willing to cast some of those things aside? Listen, that, that's a very simple thing to me. It really is. I mean, I mean, face it, I, you know, I, my daughters really rode me when I sent them a text, and it was after 2000, you know, and I finally decided to get a smartphone, and I sent them a text, and boy, they rode me. Oh, Dad's in the 21st century. <laughs> I'm like, get off my back. <laughs> you know, who had the first computer in the neighborhood? They said, we did. Who had the first cell phone that you guys remember? You did. Okay? I've been able to text for a long time. I just didn't want to do it. Okay? Now that I've started, it can't seem to stop. You know, sometimes I want to just turn it off. And, and I do. Listen, if it's, if it's time to study, if it's time to get into prayer, I just turn it off. Don't get upset with me. If you send me a text and I don't answer you right now, I'm doing something else. Okay? Lay it aside. The technology's great. It's good. But let me tell you something. Uh, when cell phones first came out, they, they consumed people, didn't it? Everybody had to have one, had to start calling when I'm driving down the road, you know, and uh, had to go in exotic places and see if my cell phone would work. You know, we were looking. Do you understand what I'm saying? These things are weights that can control us. We, we become attached to things uh, in this world. Those are weights that we need to go, get rid of. What length will you go to to have eternal life? Are we willing to let these obstacles that can be used for good get in our way and prohibit us from living as we ought to? Are we? I think a lot of us are. We're afraid to. I mean, I know people that just are consumed by watching the news constantly. Constantly. You guys all will name Mike Huckabee. You know, he ran for president here a couple of years ago and, and was governor and, 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 and is a, 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 supposedly a Christian man. I think probably he is. I haven't seen anything out of him that would make me lead otherwise. But he said he was talking to a lady one day and she was talking about how informed she was. She said, I watch Fox News 24-7. He said, then you're nuts. Because nobody needs to watch any news outlet 24-7. Addictions like that, though they're not wrong within themselves, do, do they control our lives? I, I can guarantee you that, there, that each of us, if we, we have things that we could allow to control our lives, okay? But when we get to the point, and remember our definition here about, about persevere uh, to, 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 you know, to, to really go after it and, and to persist no matter what the obstacle or discouragement comes along, Th those, when there's an obstacle or there's discouragement comes your way, they're kind of like a storm in life, aren't they? I mean, everything be going good and all of a sudden just things just seem like for, for maybe some unknown reason just go bad and discouragement sets in. I mean, people wake up in the mornings a lot of times and go, oh, I'm so discouraged today. And I think, how can you be discouraged? Nothing's happened yet. You just got up. But, but, but the enemy throws it our way, doesn't he? He throws those weights. He throws those things that get in our way to drag us down in discouragement. Let's call it a storm for just a little while because I've got a story we've got to go to, okay? It's a storm in life. They come. And storms are not just necessarily sickness. Storms are not necessarily the loss of a loved one or, or maybe of a, a, a possession. Storms are not necessarily that. Sometimes they are mental. They are psychological. Sometimes they're spiritual storms, right? What do we do to get through that storm? The worst thing you can do is sit down and have a pity party and think about it all the time. It's the worst thing you can do. Because when you sit down and start feeling sorry for yourself, you will just drag yourself deeper into discouragement and maybe into depression. That's a storm that comes our way. And, and, and trust me, they're going to come. They're meant to come. What do we do in the midst of a storm? I thought about this this week as I was thinking about preaching this. We all know the story of Paul when he was on board a ship and headed toward Rome, don't we? 
How that while one day where they were out there on the Mediterranean Sea, a great storm blew up. And it was dark. They hadn't seen, they, had, they didn't see the sun for 14 days. Do you understand that? That's how bad it was. Veteran sailors were afraid, cringing because this storm was so strong. And Paul says, after the storm, or Luke writes this over in the book of Acts, after, after the storm arises and it is so strong and the, the waves are beating into the ship and they've got a goal in mind now, okay? They've got prisoners. They've got people that they need to get to Rome. That's their goal. Our goal is not Rome. Our goal is eternal life. But here they had a natural goal to get from where they were to get to Rome. Now, they have been entrusted with the lives of these prisoners and they must, as soldiers, fulfill their obligation to get them there. So when this storm comes up and, and, and the wind's blowing and the, the waves are dashing hard, Luke writes, the next day, we lightened the ship. You know what that means? They started throwing cargo overboard. Yes, it, it might have meant to be taken somewhere, but the cargo was less important than their lives. There are things in everybody's life that are far less important than your spiritual well-being. When the storms come, throw it over. They lightened the ship. Anything that was not necessary, they lightened the ship. I told a friend of mine this week that works at uh, a school. They had canceled the school and said non Essential personnel will work from home. I said, how did it feel to be told you were non-essential? <laughs> kind of hurt. I thought I was a really important part of this organization, but they told me I could go home and work from home. That means you're a non-essential. Now, now, some of you are grinning and kind of laughing, but you, let there be an economic downturn. You'll find out how essential you are to the company you work for. You may think it revolves around you, but they will lighten the load. Why? Because they're wanting to protect their bottom line. Is not eternal life more important than the bottom line? Is eternal life not more important than being out on a ship in the middle of the ocean? Throw over the non-essentials. Stuff you don't need. You lived without a cell phone. You lived without social media. You lived without a lot of things that you think are important in your life. But let me tell you this, even though we may not label them sin or wrong, if they're not essential and they're helping drag you down, if you're running the race and you've got an extra five pounds on your back that's dragging you down and you don't need it, throw it overboard. We're endeavoring to persevere here. We have eternal life to gain if we'll throw things out of our life that are non-essential. That's how you lighten the ship. That's the first thing that they did. Three days later, the storm is still raging. They've thrown over everything that was not necessary. Now it says, Luke writes, with our own hands, we threw the ship's tackling overboard. You know what that is? That's extra rope and pulleys and sails that would be necessary for you to sail with. But what's more important, surviving the storm and the boat still floating and upright in the water or all of that stuff that's weighting you down? What's more important? You might say, well, I couldn't get rid of the ship's tackling. Listen, if you were in that situation and you were wanting to survive, you'd throw the necessary things overboard. You would unburden yourself with things that you think, I've got to have that. You'll unburden yourself with those, won't you? You say, how do you know? These guys did. Here's the fearful part. So many of us that profess to be Christians and say we're headed for eternal life are not willing to throw over the non-essential things, let alone things that are near and dear to us. If you're going to endeavor to persevere, you're going to have to be willing to unload a lot of stuff that's hindering you. I, I just feel like if we went around the room today and we asked everybody to testify, there wouldn't be one of us here that wouldn't say, you know what, there are some things in my life I could unload and I could do without them. 
I don't want to get too personal, but there might be some people you could do without. Right? People that drag you down. People that constantly have to say things that are negative and disturb you. Listen, I, I'm not telling you not to be friends with them, but don't hang out with them. Stay away from them. Okay? I mean, you don't need that kind of negativity. Nobody does. Unload some things in your life. I guarantee you all of us have things we could throw overboard, couldn't we? We could lighten the ship. There are probably some things that we think, oh, I need to hang on that one. I might need it again someday. Throw it overboard. Throw it overboard. I mean, even after I became a Christian, quit riding with the guys I was riding with. I, I still carried my switchblade. I thought I needed it. And I was in a pool room one day getting lunch down there in Columbia, and an old guy came up to me. I didn't know what a knife trader was. Never heard of one. He came up and said, what kind of knife you got? I pulled it out, pushed the button, and he about fell over. <laughs> Some young guy came up and said, oh, I'd like to have that. And I thought, you know what? I don't need it anymore. I don't need this. Oh, it was so dear to me, so essential for years in my life, and thinking, I've got to have this for personal protection. And then I realized, I don't need this anymore. Are we hanging on to things in our life that, that we, that's, you know, it's, it's our little teddy bear, our little security blanket that we're hanging on to. And, and we, we, you know, it's not really something that's, that, that's going to uh, uh, cause us to sin, but it's something that's there that we're hanging on to and we're putting a lot of trust in it. How much trust are we putting in that? Our trust needs to be in God, does it not? Our hope needs to be in Him. So we may have things in our life that are our security blanket that we need to throw it overboard. Listen, that's what they did when Paul was on the ship. And the, the storm raged on and on for more days, constantly. Listen, if they hadn't seen the sun for 14 days, that means the first day after it started, they threw it out. Three days later, they threw out all the essentials. They got 10 more days of weathering the storm before they ever make it to land. But you know what? In the end, it was worth it. In the end, it was worth it. Yeah, so worth it. Paul tells them. He said, if we'll all stay on the ship, we'll survive. we got to weather this thing. We've thrown out everything we can. Now we just got to hang in here and hold on until we see land. And they did. And they lost the ship, but their lives were saved. How willing are we to throw things away that we don't need? I'm talking about endeavoring to persevere here. Purposefully say, I don't need this in my life. I don't need that in my life. And I hope you don't have to say this, but it may come down to it to say, I don't need that person in my life. They're killing me. They're poison. I don't need them. Let me tell you what, separate yourself from people like that. It's okay to be alone, okay? It's okay. It's okay to stand by yourself. If that's what it takes, to what length will you go to attain eternal life? Throw it overboard. That's what Paul's telling us to do here, isn't he? If you're in the race and you're going to run a long time, you don't want any extra weight with you. Get rid of it. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 3. This again is Paul talking to the church at Philippi. And boy, he has some strong things to say to them. Uh, he is letting them know that there were things in his life before he became a Christian that he esteemed highly. Things that he was taught, position that he held in society and in the religion that he was in. I, I, I call, this, this is what I call the first six verses is, is Paul's brag list. He's saying these things were, these were essentials. These were important to me. And, and I'll just tell you this right now. Paul had to lose his religion in order to get saved. He had to. That's his brag list. Let's jump in here about verse 7 in Philippians chapter 3. He said... But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now, now get that. You can't be saved unless that's the way you react. 
You've got to turn loose of the old life to get the new one. All the things that were important to you, think about it. If you're a Christian today, you were willing at one point in your life, you were willing to turn your back on everything and take a hold of Christ. That's what Paul's saying. But, but listen, after we've made that, after we've made that move and we've, we've accepted Christ, listen, as we go on through life and we begin to grow, does God not show us some other things maybe that we need to get rid of? Does he not open up our understanding that, you know, this, this may not hurt you, but it's not helping you. You need to throw it over. That's what Paul's going to go ahead and talk about. Yea, doubtless, he said in verse 8, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What's Paul talking about? Eternal life. I'm willing to turn loose of everything I have, he said. I've rejected it all. It, it, it's like, and, 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 you know, we don't use the word dung anymore. Can I, can I be nice about it and use the word manure? It's what it is. It's what it is. Throw it away. It's not going to benefit you in your life. Throw it away. Paul said, I've counted it all manure, threw it all away. Why? That I may win Christ. And why do I want Christ? So that I can be found in, found in Christ, that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, so I can have eternal life. Listen, I got news for you here today, and I know, I know that there are people that disagree with me, and that's fine, okay? I hope they're living like they need to. But those who say you can't lose it once you've got it, you don't have to worry about it, I'm here to tell you today, the Apostle Paul that they said wrote about that says right here, I don't have it yet, but I'm working on it. That's what he says, doesn't he? He said, I, listen, let's go a little further, okay? Verse 12, not as I've been born, eternal life. I follow in Christ Jesus. He says it again to make it clear. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. He's fixing to unload, isn't he? He's throwing cargo overboard. Not just cargo, but essentials. Paul preached about this at one revival. He died. He died. Do you not read over there in Ephesians where he said, I am crucified with Christ and yet I live. Not I, but Christ that lives in me. Paul died on Straight Street in Damascus. He's saying right here, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's the prize? Eternal life. Here's the great apostle Paul. Listen, I got a lot of confidence in this guy. I mean, he wrote two-thirds of our New Testament, gave us a lot of doctrine that we believe in and we're trying to follow. And here he is, as great as he is and as close as he is to God, and willing to literally lay down his life for what he believes in, saying, I ain't made it yet. Makes me examine my life and say, boy, what do I need to throw overboard? If I am endeavoring to persevere, how serious am I? To what length am I willing to go to have eternal life? Let me tell you something. If you're in this thing called Christianity for the long haul, you'll be willing to unload anything. You say, anything? Anything. What is more important to you than eternal life? I hope nothing. I hope nothing. Does that mean you may lose some friendships? Maybe. 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 Does it mean you may have to go, as Paul talked about over there, willingly preaching the gospel? He didn't want to preach the gospel. Guess what? I didn't want to preach the gospel. I was perfectly content playing my guitar and singing with groups. I enjoyed that. 
I've now come to the time in my life I can enjoy it again. For years I could not because I used it to try to not do what God had asked me to do. But listen, I, I, I don't have the preacher's itch, as they call it. I'm not looking to preach everywhere. And, and sometimes I'm thinking, Lord, I don't want to preach that message to them people. They don't want to hear that. But once I get up here, wouldn't trade spots for you with you for nothing in the world because I'm where God wants me to be. I'm where God wants me to be. Has there had to be personal sacrifice to continue to do what I believe God's called me to do? Yes. Am I going to tell you about them? No. I've sacrificed some things. Relationships have had to be broken off. Distance from people that I love sometimes. But if it gets me eternal life, you know what? It's worth it. We need to lighten the ship. We need to lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Paul, the writer said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, Jesus didn't look forward to going to the cross. Do you know that? He knew that it was going to be terrible. The Bible said itself in the Old Testament, cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. He knew he was going to become a curse. He knew the pain that he was going to go through, the suffering that he was going to have. And listen, the writer says, who for the joy that was set before him, there was no joy in the cross. No, there was no joy in the cross. You know what the joy that was set before him was? Forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. That's why he went through all of that. He was willing to throw off the glory, the deity of heaven and being with the Father and come down here and put on a human body knowing he would be rejected. Not just somebody cursing him but spitting on him and plucking his beard out and beating him and planting a crown of thorns upon his head. And he was willing to do it because he knew what was on the other side. I don't know what's going to come your way and I don't know what's going to come mine. But I've got great faith in what's on the other side. I'm willing and I am endeavoring to persevere. To go through all the obstacles and the discouragement and the hardships that the world may send my way. I want eternal life. And I've not heard God say, well done yet. But I sure want to hear it. Are you willing today to strip yourself of all the weight of whatever stands in your way of eternal life? Are you willing to get rid of it? That's endeavoring to persevere. When I got into this thing called Christianity, I meant to stay in it. Oh, I've struggled sometimes. I've stumbled and fell. I'll be honest, I've, I've, I've got off the path that I should be walking before. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, you wouldn't understand this. I've, I went to Vanity Fair. I, I've, I've been bogged down in the slew of despond. All because I wasn't willing to stay on the path. But God's been willing to bring me out of those places and help me get back on the right path and walk toward my eternal home. I want it more than anything else. That means if it costs us our friendship, it'll just cost us our friendship. You understand what I'm saying? No, I, I hope it never comes to that because I love all of you. But if it comes to losing friends, I'll lose friends. If it comes to separating from family members, I'll do that again in a moment. Why? I'm endeavoring to persevere. I'm looking for eternal life. I've not made it yet. Are you willing to strip yourself of whatever stands in your way of attaining eternal life today? I hope you are. And if you're not, I hope these little series of messages we've given helps you to understand there's things we've got to do. There's things we've got to do in order to stay. And God will move a lot of things out of your way. And some things he'll help you move out of the way. 
But I'm going to warn you, oftentimes, he's left the responsibility to you to do what you need to do to get rid of the things that stand in your way. Are you willing today? I'm going to ask our song leader and musicians to come forward. If you feel like you need to pray today, maybe you've been struggling. I'm not asking you to come if you're just a sinner. If you're a sinner, we'd love to pray with you. But if you're a struggling Christian and, and, and you're finding it hard to turn loose of some things, you know what? God will help you. He'll help you. If I could do it for you, I would. I'm sure I can look in your life and find a lot of non-essentials. But on the other hand, you can probably look at mine and say, I don't know why he's even bothering with that. That's something he don't even need. Okay? But let's don't look at each other's lives. Let's look at our own. Let's look and see what's hindering us, slowing us down, blocking the path that we should be walking. And let us be willing, after we have examined ourselves, to do as Luke and Paul on that ship in that storm. Let's throw over the non-essentials. And if the storm keeps coming, throw over some stuff that are pretty important. Would you be willing to do it to get eternal life? I am. I'm in this thing for the long haul, no matter what. I hope to be able to stand before God one day, and I'm going to, and so are you. Oh, there's preachers today say, oh, Christians aren't going to be judged. Yes, you are. It's what Jesus said. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat. All, everybody. I want to stand before him and hear him say, well done. That's my goal. Is it yours? If you're struggling and you need to pray today, would you come as we stand and sing? What song? Number 468. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me.